I have with me uh, an honorable guest, Philip Morrison. Man, how are you doing? And thank you for joining the podcast. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Glad we connected and uh, glad to contribute in any way. So let's catch everybody up. You finished playing overseas in 2013. Is that correct? Uh, 15, 2015. 15. And you started yeah. the training business in 2013. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, you know how it is. Uh, I, if you go back all the way back, I was doing it in college, you know, part time in the summer here and there. Uh, when I came back from overseas, I was working as a substitute teacher, training as well. But uh, I went full time as soon as I left my last season overseas in 2015. Uh, that's when I went full time. How did you come across training? Did you know it was a, a business or was it just a hobby? Yeah, I think uh, my sophomore year of college, um, uh, I was – one, I thought I deserved to be all conference. And so when I got kind of jipped at that, it really sparked a fire in me. So I, I came consumed with consuming any kind of content, YouTube. I remember back then it was like stackmagazine.com. On, I don't know if you yeah. remember that, but I you do. Know, NBA workouts, anything, man. I came across Tim Grover and his whole relentless system. And uh, so I was looking for you know, athletic training and then basketball skills training. And uh, back then, you know, the original guys on YouTube were the resource. And of course, who is now a good friend of mine and a mentor is Gannon Baker. So he's probably the first that I saw doing it at a high level. And then as I got overseas, I came across a whole world of professional trainers that travel the world that do this full time, you know, a, a world I didn't even know existed. And uh, that probably, really sparked the, the business part of it, the business side of it. So when did you, when did you come back overseas, from overseas 2015? And you, it seems like you quickly got into running Nike camps, directing clinics. How did they go into the slums? How did that all come about? What was that process? Man, those are, those are separate things, but I'll say about the Nike. So I'm the director of Nike basketball for the state of Kentucky, as far as like the camps and things like that. I also direct uh, probably the biggest um, basketball facility in Kentucky. It's here in Louisville called Mid America Sports Center. And how I got access to all that is really uh, what you're doing. I, I saw kind of a, a need or a void that, that people weren't filling. And I was passionate about it. So I started just contacting people that were doing it. And I thought, wow, I would like to do that. And most people didn't answer me. They, you know, they didn't give me the time of the day, but a few people did. They were gracious enough to do that. And then when I saw my opportunities here, I just started emailing as many people as I could to see how did they get to that position and could they connect me with somebody. And, you know, by God's grace, I got a hold of the right people. And I was offered the position with Nike and then um, as well with uh, Mid America Sports Center. Uh, so that all kind of went hand in hand. It was just taking the time to uh, connect with people and network and, and reach out to them. So, I mean, you have a lot, and it seems like it's a lot. I'm sure it is. You have Mid-America Sports. You have the Nike clinics. You have Morrison Basketball. You have Hoops for Christ. How do you manage all of that, and which one do you spend most of your time on? Uh, well, I actually dissolved Morrison Basketball. I know the okay. trend today is to kind of um, brand after your own personal name, which I think is great. You know, a couple years ago, though, uh, the Lord made it very, very clear to me uh, what my objective was going to be. At that point, you know, very quickly, um, we grew into the biggest, the largest basketball training business in uh, Kentucky. And um, so it started out with just me and my buddy. And then we're up to, you know, 12 people on staff now, uh, five of them are full time. And so that was only my whole objective, you know, was like, I get to work with my brothers. You know what I mean? Like I doing what I love to do. I'm working with my brothers, but these are close friends of mine. And I, I started getting the sense that some of them felt like they were working for me rather than with me. And that was never my intention. So I actually dissolved anything that had to do with my name. And I went all in on hoops for Christ because, you know, my objective was to be more of a basketball missionary than just a basketball trainer. So um, I focused on the ministry aspect of it. And uh, so I pretty much put everything under Hoops for Christ now. And that includes youth leagues in multiple cities, basketball academies, camps, clinics, 
and uh, private training for uh, roughly 150 uh, private clients. And you guys, are, where is it? Australia, Kentucky, two other locations? So we're, where I'm at right now, I'm based in Louisville, Kentucky. That's kind of like the headquarters. And then we have, we've partnered with a, a facility out in Frankfurt, Kentucky, and that's kind of like the Hoops for Christ facility. So we run it in Frankfurt. Uh, one of my good friends runs it in Lexington, Kentucky, and we've got guys spaced out. And then um, my good friend, Jeremy Kendall, who plays professionally in Australia, he has uh, Hoops for Christ running in Australia, in Brisbane. Got it. I'm, I'm curious to know, and I'm jumping around here because there is a lot that I want to cover, but okay. for you leading 12 people, you, I'm sure you study Christ and his leadership example. And, and look, it's whether you're spiritual or not. I mean, the man wrote uh, a book that's been taken off the bestsellers list because it was dominating. He has <laughs> one in three people following him. Uh, the church is still going on today. So I mean, he's a great leader. Some would argue the best leader of all time. Right. On the flip side, you and I both know that this Michael Jordan series has recently, it just got, just went off great series and we saw his leadership style too. Yeah. What are those similarities and what are those differences? Uh, well, first of all, I'm the biggest Michael Jordan fan. You're not going to find a bigger Jordan fan than me. I fell in love with the game through Michael Jordan and the 90s Bulls. I'm, I'm just young enough and old enough, I guess you could say, that that was my childhood, was that 90s Bulls. And so for me, I'm a huge fan of uh, Tim Grover, his book Relentless, the following of, of – Kobe, D. Wade, but particularly Jordan, and really uh, just that mark of excellence. Now, leadership styles, those vary. You know, I mean, obviously, that's not my leadership style. But I've come across some people who, can, who do lead by that. It's a little old school, and obviously, I think you need to be cut from a different cloth to be able to live that way and operate that way, you know. But for me, as a player, I was always more of a lead by example person. I, I do. I love what Jordan said. I'll never ask anybody to do anything that I didn't already do or wasn't willing to do. You know, I had a few confrontations with teammates in the past um, where I just basically challenged them in that sense because, you know, I was always known as the work ethic guy. I would show up before anybody, stay late, and just always loved uh, training. I just loved training, that part of the game, and, and obviously it translates into what I'm doing now. Is it just me or is it the way that we communicate or relate to teammates different from the playing days to the running a training business days? Is it maturity? Is it uh, the fact that it's business and not just basketball and sports? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you'll find this out. Um, everything changes when money gets involved. When money's on the table, a lot of friendships get made and broken because of that. Unfortunately, that's happened with me. Uh, where when, when it becomes a business, then you start seeing people's motives, whether they're good or bad. And sometimes it's unintentional, you know? So I think if you're going to be a leader in that category, whether you're doing a training business or anything else, um, you, you really have to consider one, you know, underrated part of leadership taken from Jesus is, you know, the son of man came to serve and not to be served. Often leaders in today's world are, are kind of put on a pedestal and the ones below them are working with them, they tend to use to benefit, you know, or to rise them up. When, you know, my objective has always been like, I only want to be surrounded by people that are passionate about what I'm doing. And so my first rule is, would, would they be willing to do this for free? You know, do you love this so much that this is an outlet for you, like training kids, training players, getting in the gym that gives you energy and life? You know, it's not about the money because, you know, a lot of people are doing it for the money. You know, a lot, it's an easy way to make money nowadays because it's a saturated market, you know. So, I mean, that's just one way I view it as well is, is, is just that part of it. I mean, what, what, what is money to you? What does it represent for you? I mean, it's just a transaction right now. I think it represents value as well. You know, um, I think that's one of the – there's a lot of trainers that I kind of mentor and invest in. I think that's something they all kind of struggle with is like, I, I would do it for free, but I got to make money. You know, how do I market myself? How do I value myself? How do I price myself? That's a big one. What should I charge? 
one player or a team or different things like that. So, you know, for me, money doesn't really motivate me. Uh, once I became full time and my bills were taken care of, my family was taken care of, you know, my whole objective again was to make an impact. So once the money side was taken care of and I, and I figured out my own personal market, how to price myself and those things, then I could focus on more important things like making an impact. Really, because if you if you don't take care of the, the bills, then you really can't continue to make the impact, right? And what did Paul say? A laborer is work worthy of his wage, no? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So with that, with that I'm, there's a book, and it talks about the Hebrew word. One of the Hebrew words for money is dom, D-A-H-M. And it Hebrew, two words that have the same meaning. So Hebrew dom means money and blood. And two words that have the same meaning, it tells about their connections. So you think about money and blood, they have connections. One is, is blood banks. You know, you need a blood bank. Uh, there's a bank in the economy, of course, where cash runs through. The blood carries nutrients. The economy carries nutrients, which is the money itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Money is fungible. You know, you can give me a $20 bill. I can give you a different one back. It won't matter. But if we exchange cars and they're different, of course, it would matter. And they're mass now. So there's a bunch of different similarities. So I mean, for me and, and other trainers, I'd assume I'm fighting to find what that money means. And like you said, too, it represents a value or a certificate of performance from what I've read mm -hmm. as well. O on the marketing side, how do you reconcile that? If somebody's having trouble feeling like they're promoting themselves and their brands, what do you usually advise them? Well, it's really easy nowadays. This is the greatest time ever to be alive with social media, man. I mean, every day I'm blown away at uh, the ripple effects. Um, where are you based out of? I am in South Carolina. Okay, so Carolina. your point of impact, like if you throw a rock into the water and the splash happens, mine's in Louisville, yours in South Carolina, okay, or I'm in Kentucky, and, and that's where we live, the point of impact. What we don't get to see, and often what God doesn't show us, is the ripple effect that goes out. And that's been, you know, just, it's, it's been quadrupled with social media because you can reach people around the world so much easier nowadays. You know what I mean? So when it comes to that, I think the best advice I could give to a trainer is to go all in on social media and to not focus on um, the numbers or the followers or anything else, but putting out quality content. You know, I just feel like uh, that's the best way to market yourself try to dominate your market where you live. Cause that's probably what's going to feed 99% of trainers is, you know, you're not going to, there's only a few that can really make money like legitimate money through the internet, but the majority of ones that are starting out or, or they're trying to move into that category of doing it full time. I think they should really just network and, and uh, dominate social media where they're at. You know what I mean? Connect with as many coaches where they're at post, as much as they possibly can. Um, I always say treat social media like your full-time job because that's where the people are at. They're, they're on social media, the eyes are there. You know, so that, I would say marketing-wise, social media is, would be the place to actually focus on and, and provide as much value as possible, you know, and not get too caught up in the entertainment side and not get too caught up in the numbers. Let's, let's stay there for a minute. So if, if Jesus had a social media account today. I personally think he would market all the time too. I mean, what does the Bible say? I think it's in John. He, if we were to document everything that he said, all the stories, all the actions he took, then we would still have stories today. It wouldn't be able to fit yeah. in this book. Uh, it's this rough paraphrase, but how do you think he would market today? Oh, I don't know, man. I, uh, you know, I'm a little weary of talking about what, what, I, what, what I think Jesus would do, but you know, what I would say for sure is um, those who, I just, uh, here's, let me take this for example, Billy Graham, he's a good example, okay? Because Billy Graham, probably the most well-known preacher of the modern era, he had to travel the world, spent his life traveling the world on crusades and spoke to huge stadiums, you know, some hundred thousands of people, right? Imagine if Billy Graham came up with social media where you're reaching millions of people. Cause I can guarantee if Billy Graham's one of the first people on there, it, his messages are going to be broadcast. You know, obviously he had television, but you know, he had to put in all this work, time, resources, money to make those things happen. 
And we all you all we need now is a phone and the platform and the talent to do it. You know, so that's again, I just feel like if it was today's and age, it's the easiest time to reach people if you got the juice. Now, if you don't have anything to say and nothing to offer, then that's one thing. But if, if you have a, a message or a talent for something, I think this is the easiest way to reach people. How much time do you spend on a daily basis? Creating graphics, posting IG lives, recording videos? Uh, well, I, I try to, I've try to record almost everything I do at this point when it comes to basketball training that I, that I would see valuable. But I actually have someone who films with me now and helps edit. So um, I'm not doing everything by myself anymore. But like I said, I do it every day, though, because I saw the value of it. And it was probably one of the most important moves I made as far as growing the business side of what I do, um, which was trying to post consistent content that brings value, you know, that helps people still teaches, you know, doesn't move into the realm of just, you know, trying to get clicks and, and, and followers and, and engagement, but actually trying to help people, even if the, the views or the likes are low. What is it say for, I've gotten different responses for that. For some trainers, they say they have pretty sizable followings and they say mm -hmm. social media doesn't help their local brick and mortar businesses. But then I hear you talking and I'm curious to know what that, the impact is whether that's kids in the gym or trainees in the gym or whether that's just more of a spiritual impact. What do you mean that it's, it's helped you out? How it well, you? well, it's twofold. One is uh, let's just take the, the ministry aspect. Now when I'm training, let's say one-on-one -on -one, I'm, I'm out here in my backyard and I'm going to be training for four hours a day. Players coming over with gym still closed, you know, they're paying me to train them. And so occasionally I'll get an opportunity to like really speak into them, invest in them. But for the most part, they're here to train. You know what I mean? So what I found is these kids live on social media. They just live on it. So where I'm actually going to be able to speak to them where sometimes face-to-face -face communication, maybe they're not as comfortable with, they're going to watch all the stories. They're going to watch the IGTVs or the YouTube. They'll watch the full video. And that's why I post so many like devotionals. Uh, because I know they're going to see that they're going to listen to it and absorb it in a way that maybe I don't have time to do when I'm training, you know, and so but when I do clinics and camps, I have a, a period where I can sit everyone down and speak to them, you know, but that's where you can really reach them, I think, because parents are listening, you know, kids are listening and all that. But I think it does help your local I'm, I'm a business, to be honest with you. If you make a, let's say you take make a Facebook page, for instance, because majority of Facebook at this point is parents and grandparents, you know, kids have moved, gravitated away from that. So, but they're the ones that pay. So those are the ones you need to reach. If you're running Facebook ads and you have a Facebook page, okay. And you're consistently posting. It's like, you know, your reviews, you know, you gain reviews from local parents. They're seeing it. Usually your friend list is local people as well. People that support you or people that train with you. So, you post in their kid, oh, they're, they're wanting that. They're wanting to repost it. They're wanting to, and then, and you get, you know, a couple kids that are, are notable in the area. Well, then they, their friends want to train with you, you know, and it, it just kind of spreads like that. So I'm, I'm really big about that. Maybe more Facebook than Instagram, but I think uh, it definitely helps local. I know it's helped me a ton locally. I really appreciate that. So uh, I'm curious to talk about Gannon Baker. I know he's a man mm -hmm. of faith too. And, the OG in the, in the space, right? Mm -hmm. What was that yeah. like for you actually going down to train with him and to learn from him? What was that? Okay. Experience? Yeah, yeah, you saw that, huh? That was a while back. Um, well, Gannon is, uh, I personally consider Gannon the goat of skills development, especially in the private sector like we're in. And uh, he could have gone the route of MBA or college or anything else. But I mean, I really feel like that would have caged his real gift and his energy and enthusiasm that he can give out in the world. But, you know, when I first met Gannon, um, that was really weird because I've been seeing this dude on YouTube for years. You know what I mean? It was, it's like almost like, is this really Gannon Baker right here? You know what I'm saying? Like, because, uh, I think in person, I realize even more why I think he is the GOAT because his gifts and energy are ridiculous, like ridiculous. 
I saw this man, I'll tell you a story. I saw this man teach, I'm talking about sweating, demoing, teaching for six straight hours. And at the end, he does some kind of wild Kobe Bryant drill where he's got him, he's got to make in like one minute, he's doing dead sprints to NBA three pointers. And he's shooting with both hands, right hand, left hand. And he doesn't miss a shot after six straight hours, right? So the next day, we, we go out to eat that night. The next day, I'm on the court with him for two, just two of the hours of the six, teaching and training, and I'm dead. So I'm like, I'm dead. And I'm, I'm like 15 years younger than G. I'm like, I'm dead. The next morning, I'm like, I'm going to see what this dude's about. The third day, I get to the gym at 8 in the morning. He's in a full sweat working out and goes another six hours. And I was like, I've never, and there's no fall off. Like he just stays right here. And I've just never seen anything like that in person. Like, it's like not even human, the kind of energy. So that was my first impression in person of Gannon. And he, like, he just hit me up actually this morning, sent me a long thing, helping me out, mentoring me. So uh, he's just a stand up guy, you know, but it was definitely great to connect to somebody like that. I think everyone should have, a few of those guys in their life that are willing to pour into them. Where does that energy and drive come from? And is that something that he advises all trainers to be able to do if they're going to be teaching other trainees? Nah, a lot of guys don't have that. You know that some guy, I, I, I'm more laid back than Gannon. I would consider myself having good energy, but I don't, I, I would need to take something to have that kind of energy. bro. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, Gannon's the first one to say this. You know, I did a little IG live interview with him and from the faith point of view, and he attributes everything he does, the success of his business, his energy to the Holy Spirit. You know, he makes up stuff on the spot. You know, G's the king of the one-liner. He's got every punchline in the, in the book when it comes to training. And, you know, he, he attributes that to God's hand on his life. And I'm, and I'm the same way. I feel like, you know, if you're really good at this, you know, in a sense, that's, you know, from Matthew 5, that's the light that God has given you in this world to shine. And so I think you really just need to find your own voice. The worst thing you could do is try to imitate or copy somebody and you don't have that juice. Like, that's not you, you know, because people can see that immediately whenever you're, you're kind of fake and phony. And I do see that a lot, you know, and I think some of it maybe trainers or coaches are trying to find themselves. So that's cool. You know, that's a process. But I think you should figure out, you know, how God has designed you um, and just run with that. How do you reconcile guys like Gannon, uh, yourself, that are ultra competitive? I mean, you said you felt some type of way about not getting all conference your sophomore year. I'm mm -hmm. sure Gannon has a competitive drive, too. How do you reconcile that idea of competition, Christianity, being moral, but also have an intensity for what you do? That's a good point, man. Actually, my first Zoom meeting with the Sports Commission uh, started something called the Sports Commission, where we have other Christian coaches and trainers from around the world getting together and have guests. My first topic was the competitive Christian. And I talked about that struggle I had. And, and that was the turning point for me, really, was when I realized that I can't truly glorify God with the little bit of talent or the opportunity I have if I don't come at it with a killer mindset. Like I just can't do it. And my buddy, Jeremy Kendall, who's in Australia, he talked about when, you know, David defeated Goliath in the name of God, he didn't think twice when he cut his head off after he defeated him. So, you know, I approach it in that sense, you know, competition is competition. You know what I mean? So many verses in the Bible talk about, we all run the race, but only one wins the crown. So run in a way that you want to win. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, like, what are you doing out here? You know, nobody plays, you know, second place is the first loser, straight up. So what I'm trying to do is just throw myself into it in a way and be competitive. And, um, you know, it took me time to figure that out, but to learn how to turn that on and off when I step between the lines uh, was a struggle for me in the beginning. But I think you really have to have that to survive in anything, especially in this business. It's so saturated and competition and basketball whether you're a player coach or trainer it's it's like very saturated so you know you you have to have something special about you and grit to you to to survive
as I carry over into not, of course, the same competitiveness. Like you're not trying to go at wifey, you're trying to go at your son yet, I'd, I'd assume. But does that competitiveness to be whatever you are in that moment carry over to the husband, the father, whatever else you would consider yourself? Uh, no, not at all. No, uh, when you know when um when I'm with my son, it's just uh it's just laid back and fun and. My wife is my biggest supporter, but also my biggest critic. So she's more of a sounding board because we're on the same team, you know. So the competition is more of, you know, you know how we can do this together. You know what I mean? But or mine is more like when it comes to business or when I step between the lines, being competitive in that way, you know. But, you know, that's a tricky, that's a tricky thing because you've got to really balance pride as well. You know, you can easily get caught up in ego and pride. Um, but my wife and, and my son, I think more than anything, balance me out and, and mellow me out for sure. Makes sense. And I, and I asked the key dean this question too. Is he more of a guy that likes to compete against others or is he a guy that is competing, considers himself competing against himself? Against yeah, I only him. compete with myself. <laughs> I only compete with myself. I understand the idea of competition. I love the quote that Mark Cuban has. He says, you got to work in a way that you know somebody else out there is working 24 hours away to take away everything you built. You know, in, in our business, when it comes to skills training, let's just say in your city, if there's another trainer in your city, in mine, I got one of the most uh, basketball saturated markets in the country. So they're on every corner. Now I know those guys know the same clients I know, know the same market, have to deal with the same gyms, the same coaches, teams. So they know, we know each other's market. So, the, at the end of the day, you know, um, there's that competition is real. But here's what I look at it as. I don't need you to lose for me to win. This isn't, this isn't us playing anymore. You know what I mean? Like if we're playing against each other, then I need you to lose. I'm trying to win. But in, when you're trying to make an impact in your training kids in a big market, small market might be different, but in a big market, there's too many, there's too many people out there for one person or one company to impact. So my thing is, I think it's better to network in that sense. You know what I mean? For sure. And I have one, maybe two more questions uh, before we get into the sports commission, the patron, mm -hmm. I believe I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly in the different tiers within it. Uh, what, where did the business acumen come from? Did you, you said you had 12 teammates. Are they 1099s? Are they W2s? Uh, oh, well, I'll take it back a little bit. So the business part actually was everything I had to kind of learn on the fly. I wouldn't say that's necessarily my forte. I didn't get a business degree. Um, but uh, I think when my last season overseas, I started really understanding like this is the transition I want to make. I want to go into this full time. Nobody thought I could do it, especially since nobody was really doing what I was doing. There was no, there was no, uh, person or blueprint to be like he's going to be almost like a minister but he's doing basketball full-time you know what I mean so it was, it was a little I could look at some people so what I did was I just started reading man I just started reading as many books watching as many YouTube videos as I could trying to learn from other people and that's where the business part came out of it and then I had to structure my business um, around what what worked for me you know what I mean? So you got to figure out, do you want to be an LLC or an S corp or a nonprofit? You know, are you, are you going to pay people salaries? Are you going to 1099 them? You know, those are things I think everyone has to figure out what works best for them. And I would say 99% of people are just trying to make enough for themselves in basketball training world. Cause there's not a ton of money, you know, in basketball training. So, you know, I've been very fortunate that I live in a market that has allowed me to grow it to the scale that I have other guys that can do it full time. You know what I mean? I do. I do. I appreciate that. So uh, tell me this, could you explain what the sports commission is again and the patron or Patreon, what those different tiers entitle? Yes. I, I appreciate that plug, man. So the, uh, I started getting into zoom just like we're doing here with time slowing down. And I, I think zoom is, is going to win and stay here, bro. After we go back to normal life, I think Zoom, everyone is accustomed to it now. We're comfortable with it, and we're going to stay here. So what you're doing is great. 
what I did was I started a Zoom group. It's free. Anybody can sign up for it through um, my website, hoopsforchrist.org slash sports commission. And I just bring in guests. I have pro players, coaches, uh, trainers. I've got a pastor coming in this week. And it's just for anybody around the world. I think we have 160 people signed up right now from uh, 14 countries that are just trying to use their sports platform to glorify God. You know, they have some kind of heart for sports ministry, making an impact beyond their sport. And uh, so we just have these Zoom meetings, you know, every week or biweekly that they can sign up for. And our next one is coming up this Thursday at 9 p.m. And then um, I started my online training program as well. I've been sitting, I've had hours and I feel like I'm making my own last dance documentary, man. <laughs> I've been sitting on hundreds of hours of film on ice just because I've been so busy working, you know, six days a week in the gym training. I hadn't right. put in the time and focus to make a quality program. So I did one on Patreon. For those that aren't familiar with patreon.com, it's basically a donation-based um, platform. So uh, it's usually 10 to 20 a month, but during the COVID crisis, uh, I, I knew money was a big issue for a lot of families and kids. So I decided to make it free. Um, you just sign up. I think, I think it's a dollar to sign up, but I'll Venmo or PayPal that back to you um, if that's an issue. And um, it's just a donation to Hoops for Christ. And that's where I upload all my videos, training videos, pro workouts, kids workouts, devotionals, talks, interviews, everything is, is within there. I like it. And where can we go for that, for Patreon? Uh, it'd be patreon.com slash Hoops for Christ. You know, if anyone follows me on Instagram um, at Hoops of Christ or my personal account where I post basketball at Morrison underscore B ball, all that stuff's in the bio, links in the bio. Yes, sir. And I will include that in the show notes here, too. Is there any last words or parting words for the trainers, players, whoever's listening to this? Yeah, I'd say for anyone that, that, that gets into it, I would say um, if you feel called to do this and, and you feel gifted to do this, my best advice is to really reverse engineer. You know, you only work hard at things that you love. So if you're in it for the right reasons and you feel called to do it, then you'll be willing to put in the time and work and sacrifice uh, to grow. Because if you don't love it, somebody out there who does love it will put in the time and the work. And, um, and if it's your gift, you feel like, man, this is what God's put me on this earth to do to make an impact through training or coaching. Um, I would say follow that with all your heart. You know what I mean? Don't remove the plan B because there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to pull out and quit and people tell you to pull out and quit, but you really have to go all in uh, to make it work. Philip Morrison, thank you for sharing your wisdom and experiences with me. All right, brother. We'll be connected. <laughs>